We now come to talk about the third strategic choice that comprises an entrepreneurial strategy, and that is choosing your identity. This is actually one of the more subtle choices one could make, uh, and so much so that we've split it down into four dimensions as well. Uh, that doesn't make it any less critical, less difficult, or anything like that. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you can't think about how it fits in with customer technology and competition choices as well. What identity is, is essentially how you represent your business, your venture to various constituents. For instance, your employees. Part of what uh, makes strategy effective is that you're not managing or micromanaging effectively uh, what other people do. So your employees have to make decisions just like you do. But what you want to ensure is that they are aligned with the direction you want your venture to go in. This is not just something unique to entrepreneurial firms. This also applies uh, to corporate strategy or not for profit strategy or anything like that. So your identity is effectively how you want to communicate priorities to your employees uh, so that they can figure out what they should be doing based on what you want them to do. You also want to be able to represent yourself to the market. This most critically arises when you're thinking about uh, how you want competitors or suppliers or customers to see what you are doing, especially with regard to competitors. Um, are you the sort of firm that is going to be an aggressive competitor or a firm that is going to try and stake out your uh, particular area of the market? Those are things that comprise your identity. You also want to represent yourself to complementary asset holders. These are people outside your organization, other organizations, that have assets that you need to uh, access in order to create value. You want to know, those people want to know whether you're orienting yourself towards them or you see them as a rival in negotiations over the division of surplus. And it turns out that how you create your identity, how you choose to represent yourself to employees, the market, complementary asset holders, is in effect a choice. All of those things are choices. Now, of course, you can't just freely choose. You have to think about how it fits in with everything else and with each other. But that's how you should think about identity. So the way we represent this is uh, in four dimensions. Founder objective, internal capabilities, external position, and ecosystem. Your founder objective is an overarching uh, choice in identity. It means different things to different people, but it's just, generally speaking, a communication of what you as a founder want to accomplish. Are you going to have any social, or is everything going to be purely commercial in your business? Uh, if you think about Tesla, Tesla was founded on missions uh, and other things to be saving the world, uh, world from environmental disaster. It need not have been founded that way. It could have been founded just to be able to make another car company. That's a very different uh, choice of identity, but it does communicate to the world what it is doing. It does allow it to make sense of things like acquiring Solar City, which is aligned on that saving the world type mission. This founder objective also starts to tell you about when a founder will think something is successful or not when you'll be making progress. The second dimension is internal capabilities. What capabilities are you going to emphasize that you want to be developed inside your organization? So that's how you put together the founding team as part of that. Do you get more technical specialists, business development specialists? Do you emphasize marketing and so on? Where do you allocate internal resources? you allocate it towards making the product better or to lowering costs? 
That's just some of the designs you could have. And what are, is your incentive structure like? Are you giving people stock options? Are you keeping be, uh, rewarding people based on how their individual area does? Or is it all based on the entire uh, profits and shareholder value of the company? All these things are part of the development of internal capabilities. And so when I said identity was choosing how you communicate to employees, it's on this dimension that that becomes relevant. As for your external position, the third dimension of identity, how are you going to position yourself to achieve your objective? There are other people in the market. There are competitors. Uh, uh, there are rivals of various kinds. There are people producing substitute products. Where are you going to align yourself? Where are you positioning yourself in the value chain? Who are going to be your allies? Who are going to be your uh, competitors? How are you thinking about the evolution of the industry? How are you thinking about your own reputation? So when Elon Musk decided to uh, open up all of his patents for electric vehicles for Tesla, what he was saying was, I am in a market where I'm trying to compete with other car makers. I am not trying to compete with other electric car makers. If they can do well, that will help my mission of developing a new car and also my mission of environmental success. You may have already uh, come across these sorts of choices before when looking at Porter's Five Forces, which makes a distinction between competition and substitutes, which can be rather nebulous. In effect, electric car makers and car makers are all competitors to Tesla. But what it shows in making this decision to compete to be a global car company was it chose a market that put all of those cars in uh, the competitor lock and substitutes were things like trains and other form of transportation. Again, this is a choice you can make in terms of your identity and for external positioning that is how you are communicating your strategy and your choices to the rest of the world. The final dimension for identity is ecosystem. The most obvious choice a uh, venture has to make is where are you going to be located. The idea is to locate in a, you, well, the idea usually is to locate near resources you need, but sometimes you have some trade-offs there. Do you locate near the resources or do you locate closer to your customers? And this could happen not just in physical space, but in terms of where you have your network flows, where you, uh, conferences you attend, trade shows you uh, emphasize, and even the kind of funding you get and the capabilities of those funders. So all of that constellation is what identity is. Now we already saw this uh, uh, earlier uh, with a discussion of Clover Food Labs as a very clear choice of identity. Clover Food Labs, as you might recall, was a food truck business founded by an MIT engineer trying to make healthy foods. It has now gone beyond the food truck business, and this is how it started, to its physical stores. And in its physical stores, you can get things like, you know, this falafel pita. And you'll notice there you can get pour over coffee. The orders are not taken at a checkout, but by a person sitting there with an iPod or an iPhone. And the kitchen is open for everybody to see, much as might be. <laughs> it's not quite with a food truck. They're usually a bit higher, but it's, it's right there and open. The idea is uh, conveying to customers that everything is fresh and allowing them to see that in the construction and the layout of the entire business. And that seeps into other choices too. Here's Clover's, uh, from their website, their own discussion about why they're different from other fast food companies. And it is an interesting read. One I'll bring note to is it impacts on technology. Trying to be fresh means you have no freezers. A freezer is a technology that 
every single other restaurant chooses. But at Clover, they don't do one. Okay, what does that mean? That means a lot of other things flow from that. One is everything has to be fresh. You have no choice. Second, they uh, organize stuff around that, showing people that you cut the tomatoes just before eating them. They'll keep better. They end up committing to keep money in the region. Why? There are no freezers. It has to be kept in the reason, region. They end up using a lot of organic ingredients. Actually, that's a little surprise with the lack of free, uh, freezers, but it's part of their identity. Okay, so there's no preservatives, no natural flavors, etc. going on there. Everything is paid to improve health. But what's really interesting is, you know what you can't have with a freezer? You can't have meat, poultry, and similar products. So this is a vegetarian restaurant. Now, I want you to step back and think about that. It's a vegetarian restaurant that does something unique. It does not say it is vegetarian. That is a choice of external positioning. Clover Food Labs has decided they are competing in the fast food market. They are not competing in the vegetarian market. That is quite a distinct choice, but it does change how they operate. It means potentially they can get a higher diversity of clientele because if you're vegetarian, you'll know about this. But it also means that they do not have to specifically uh, push themselves for the taste of vegetarians. They don't have to, uh, you know, use quinoa and other things like that necessarily because it's the latest fad. Instead, they can focus on taste. And they're going to figure out how to uh, bring this fresh vegetarian food and make it taste well whereas once you label yourself vegetarian maybe you don't have to do that as much that's at least the thesis that it's operating under what i want to turn to now to show you how important identity is is to convince you that it is something that is chosen right at the beginning it's a choice. You can go one way or another, but it's chosen invariably at the beginning of organizations and some of the most successful ones, you can see that identity persist. And I'm going to show you two examples of that now. Hi, I must apologize to you all for being late. I was driving here 90 miles an hour. I couldn't find a parking place and make all the experiences you've been through this morning. Um, had a uh, photographer from Scientific American who wanted to take some pictures in the last few days. So we went over to a school. We thought they decided they wanted to take some pictures of someone from Apple in an educational setting using some computers. And we wandered over. Turns out there's a little booklet that is put out in Cupertino and there's about 20 different schools with apples and we picked one out that had six Apple computers and wandered over there one afternoon and this happened to be the afternoon that the fourth and fifth graders were going to be there once a week fourth and fifth graders from this one school in a sort of an advanced learning program come over and use the Apple computers and I had the most delightful conversation with some four and five year olds they they probably know as much about the computer as I do <laughs> maybe more and they're, they're totally fluent in it, and they're very much at home in it, and they beat me in most of the games in it. And it was really quite an experience, because we, we always talk about all these things happening, sort of at the intellectual, verbal level, but actually got a chance to see 20 students interacting with these computers on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I, I couldn't help remembering my own school days when none of these things existed, and we just get into trouble all the time. 11.30 at night, last night, a friend of mine, Bob Medcalf, calls me up, and uh, he's got three German friends visiting from Germany, and they want to buy 20 to 30 apples a month for some god-awful who knows what reason. And they want them in Germany, and they want to talk about buying them at 11.30 at night. Um, and, you know, a guy in Nebraska is using an Apple computer to calculate soil samples to know what kind of fertilizer to put in the ground. It just, it's an endless array of things that people are doing with this. Watch your mic. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, the other one. 
The other one. Tier one. Tier one. Tier one. Tier one. We had absolutely no idea what people were going to do with these things when we started out. Uh, matter of fact, the two people it was designed for was Waz and myself, <laughs> because we couldn't afford to buy a computer kit on the market. So we liberated some parts from Hewlett Packard and Atari, and uh, worked on a design for about six months and decided that we would uh, build our own computer. So we built one, and uh, Waz was up till four in the morning for many moons, and we got it working. We showed some of our friends. Immediately, everybody wanted one. And it turned out that it took about 40 hours to build one of these things, and about another 20, 30, 40 to debug it. And we had a lot of friends that worked at similar companies who could liberate the parts also. And <laughs> we found ourselves spending every spare moment of our time helping our friends to build computers. And it was just getting to be a, a tremendous drain on our, on our lives. So we got the idea one day that, that we could make a printed circuit board uh, without the parts in it and sell these blank printed circuit boards to our friends and probably cut the assembly and debug time down to, you know, five, ten hours. So Waz sold his HP6 calculator and I sold my van and we got 1300 bucks together and we paid our friend of ours who was this uh, PC board layout person, 1300 bucks to do us a layout and decided we'd sell printed circuit boards at twice what it cost to build them and hopefully recoup our calculator and transportation at some later date. So that's what we did, and I was out trying to pedal PC boards one day and walked into a bike shop, the first bike shop in Mountain View, and uh, Paul Terrell, the then owner of the bike shop, said uh, he would like to take 50 of these computers. And I saw dollar signs in front of my eyes. <laughs> and, but he had one catch, which was that he wanted them fully assembled and tested, ready to go, which is a new twist. So we spent the next five days on the phone to distributors and convinced the electronics parts distributors around here to give us about $10,000 worth of parts on thin air, just on enthusiasm. So we got the parts and we built 100 computers and we sold 50 of them for cash and 29 days paid off the distributors. And that's how we got started. So we had 50 computers left over. Well, that meant we had to sell them. So then we started worrying about marketing, worrying about distribution, got on the phone with the other computer stores around the country. And gradually the whole thing began to build momentum. And at that point in time, we had some feeling that we were on to something, but the, the feeling was, is, is so different than the experience of actually seeing it happen right now. It's entirely different. And uh, sometimes a lot, a lot of people ask, well, did you know it was going to mushroom into this phenomenon? And you could say, yeah, you know, we planned it out. We had lead on a piece of paper. But it's different than the experience of seeing 500 people working at Apple Computer. It's very different than the experience of seeing a five-year-old kid who uh, really understands what he's, the tool that he's got in front of him. And it, the, the best analogy I've ever heard is uh, Scientific American, I think it was, did a study in the early 70s on the efficiency of locomotion. In other words, what they did was for all different species of things on the planet, birds and cats and dogs and fish and man and goats and stuff, they measured how much energy does it take for a goat to get from here to there, right? kilocalories per kilometer or something, I don't know what they measured it in. And they ranked them, they published a list, and, and the condor won. The condor took the least amount of energy to get from here to there. And man was, didn't do so well, came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. But fortunately, someone at Scientific American was insightful enough to test man with a bicycle. And man with a bicycle won, twice as good as the condor, all the way off the list. And what it showed was that man as a tool maker has the ability to make a tool to amplify an inherent ability that he has. And that's exactly what we're doing here. It's exactly what we're doing here. We're not making bicycles to be ridden between Palo Alto and San Francisco. Okay, we're making bicycles. And yes, certain bicycles have certain generic attributes, like in general, 10 speeds are better to ride in mountains than one speeds and other things like that. But in general, what we're doing is we're building tools that amplify a human ability. Just like the, um, you could say that the Industrial Revolution was basically an amplification of a human ability, sweat. Right? We amplified sweat, fractional horsepower motors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What we're working towards now is the ability to amplify another human ability. And 
we're just starting to get glimmerings of where it's going to go. As an example, um, how many of you use VisiCalc? <coughs> Quite a few of you. At Apple, uh, every secretary now has an Apple on his or her desk. And they're doing all their word processing on them. You've got to give them credit for that, given the software that's out. <laughs> and, uh, they're doing a tremendous amount of financial modeling on the thing. As an example, I, I have to keep a budget for about 40, 50 people. And uh, by the 10th of every month, my secretary's got all the information from accounting, put it into the VisiCalc model, and given me the actuals versus forecast and all the variances and et cetera, et cetera. And we're asking what if questions on a daily basis. I, I can say, her name is Pat, I can say, Pat, what happens if I hire five more people this month? You know, what's that going to do to the budget? An hour later, I know. It's incredible. And what's even more incredible is when you go talk to these fifth graders, because they're growing up with this thing. You know, it's new for myself. I didn't know anything about this stuff 15 years ago, 10 years ago. But these kids are growing up with it. Um, I've seen some of the kids of people that work at Apple, I've seen go from being one, two years old, where they push the return key. You know, they sit on their father's lap and mother's lap, and what their part is is to push the return key. <laughs> to actually know how to program in the last four years. It's remarkable. So, one of the things that that Apple is going to try to do over the next three or four years is to, to further that goal. And the key area we're focusing on is the following. Right now, if you buy a computer system and you want to solve one of your problems, we immediately throw a big problem right in the middle of you and your problem, which is learning how to use the, the, the computer. Right? Substantial problem to overcome. Once you overcome that, it's a, a phenomenal tool. But there is a barrier of having to overcome that problem. What we're trying to do, and I think there's a reasonable chance that Apple's going to make a real contribution to solving this problem in the next 36 months, is to remove that barrier so that someone can buy a computer system that knows nothing about it, and directly attack their problem without learning how to program the computer. And the reason I think that Apple's got a chance of solving that problem versus a lot of other computer companies that we all know of that are much, much larger than we are now, although we're catching up, uh, is that our whole company, our whole philosophical base is founded on one principle. And that one principle is that there's something very special and very historically different that takes place when you have one computer and one person. Very different than if you have 10 people and one computer. And let's look at some of the things that, that our industry has, or our segment of the computer industry has contributed to the computer industry because of that underlying philosophical concept. In general, we were in retail distribution channels three, four years before the rest of the computer industry is now waking up to that fact. Why? Because to serve that one-on-one -on -one relationship, it was necessary to, to distribute the products that way. It was necessary to have products priced so that a person, one-on-one, -on -one, could afford the computer system. And therefore, it was necessary to distribute them through a relatively lower cost distribution channel rather than a direct sales force. Interactive software, uh, interactive video, a computer system that can be sold for a few thousand dollars that can actually do some animation that actually has the video that's so tightly coupled to the rest of the computer that you can do real-time. We've got a DEC 1170 at Apple where the terminals communicate with the 1170 at, you know, 9,600 bits per second. That, that can't do anything like VisiCalc can. Okay? This is $300,000 computer system. And yet my secretary keeps the budgets on an Apple. It's far superior. So, and again, that comes from that one-on-one -on -one interaction. And that perspective is what gives us the feeling that we have an opportunity to really contribute to solving that problem. And that's where Apple's going. Now, we're very fortunate because the timing seems to be falling into place. In other words, as we move into the 80s, the amount of, of computational power, the amount of raw horsepower we can get into a small box for a reasonable price is, is staggering. 
even in the last three years, since you know, four years since we started, it's it's increased a few orders of magnitude. And one of the things that people always ask me is, uh, you know, that what what we've got right now is just fine. Physic health runs fast enough. You know, some of the database stuff runs fast enough. What are we going to do with this extra awesome power? And the answer to that is that we're going to put it into applying, in, into solving that problem again. In other words, we're going to start chewing up power specifically to help that one-on-one -on -one interaction go smoother. And specifically not to actually do the number crunching and the database management and the word processing or whatever. We're actually going to start applying a lot of that power specifically to help us remove that barrier. And so, assuming that we don't get into World War III, and assuming that we're able to continue to recruit outstanding people, it looks like the timing's just right for that to occur. So hopefully, when we have our International Apple Corps meeting, you know, the third, fourth one from now, we'll all be able to, to talk about how we've solved that problem, because I really think it's going to happen. And I really think it's going to come out of an industry that four years ago didn't exist, that three years ago everyone said was a flash in the, fl in the frying pan, you know? And uh, but I think right now we're starting to wake up. So thank you very much. Hi there, who are you? I'm Jeff Bezos. And what, are you, what is your claim to fame? <laughs> I'm the founder of Amazon.com. Where did you get an idea for Amazon.com? Well, three years ago, I was in New York City working for a quantitative hedge fund when I came across the startling statistic that web usage was growing at 2,300% a year. So I decided I would try and find a business plan that made sense in the context of that growth. And I picked books as the first best product to sell online, which are making a list of like 20 different products that you might be able to sell. And books were great as the first best, because books are incredibly unusual in one respect, and that is that there are more items in the book category than there are items in any other category by far. Music is number two. There are about 200,000 active music CDs at any given time. But in the book space, there are more than three million different books worldwide active and in print at any given time across all languages more than one and a half million in English alone. And so when you have that many items, you can literally build a store online that couldn't exist any other way. And that's important right now because the web is still an infant technology. Basically right now, if you can do things using a more traditional method, you probably should do them using the more traditional method. What kind of inventory do you keep? We inventory uh, the best-selling books. At any given time, we're inventorying in our own warehouse only a couple of thousand titles. And then we have, we do almost in time inventory for another 400,000 titles or so. We get those from a network of electronic, we order, order electronically from a network of wholesalers and distributors. We order those today, they're on our loading dock the next morning. Then for another uh, 1.1 million titles, we get those directly from 20,000 different publishers, and those can take a couple of weeks to get. And then, the, uh, there, there are a million out-of-print books in our catalog. We have a catalog of two and a half million books altogether. Those million out-of-print books, some of them we can get and some of them we can't, but we find them uh, if we can, and then we ship them to our customers. We do a, kind of a search on those. What's almost in time inventory? Almost in time inventory is the phrase we use to describe a whole selection of, of books that we offer. It's basically the things that are you know, below the 2,000th best-selling book up to the 400,000th best-selling book. Those are titles that we can get from a network of more than a dozen different wholesalers. So if a customer orders a book from us today, we order that book from our wholesalers today, and that book shows up on our loading dock the next morning, and then we can ship it to the customer. They say one of the toughest things to do on the internet is to capture mind share. What was your secret? How did you do that? Yeah, even more generally, I agree with you that you know capturing mind share on the internet is extremely difficult. Even more generally, it's the late 20th century, not just the internet. You know, capturing attention. Attention is the scarce commodity of the late 20th century, and one of the ways that you can do that, and it's the way that we did it, was by doing something new and innovative for the first time that actually has real value for the customer. That's a hard thing to do, but if you do do that, then 
newspapers will write about you, what you're doing. Customers will tell other customers, and you'll get a huge sort of word of mouth fan out, and and that can really drive and accelerate businesses. And that's what happened with us in the first year of opening Amazon.com to the public. We didn't do any paid advertising, and all of our growth was fueled by word of mouth and media exposure. I saw little ads at the bottom of the column of the New York Times. That was our very first advertising. Um, we don't do that anymore, but at the, very, at the very beginning, we did little tiny ads at the bottom of the front page of the New York Times. I thought that was very clever. It's sort of using a URL as a macro, because I, I read... That it expands. We're a bookstore. Click here. Right. That's a great way to think of it. And it worked very well, apparently. I don't know. You know, the problem with that kind of advertising is it's extremely difficult to track. Um, Put a different of, URL for every... Uh, <laughs> that's the problem, is that you want people to start to learn your URL, so you don't want to actually use a different one. And it's very uh, easy. One of the great things about online ads, we do advertising today in maybe 40 different uh, on, uh, on different websites. We do banner ads. And that advertising is very easy to track in terms of knowing how effective it is. So we know for each piece of creative in each venue, not only how many click-throughs we get, but how many sell-throughs we get, and how many dollars of revenue it generates per ad dollar spent on that creative in that venue. And that is a, sort of a marketer's uh, you know, nirvana in a certain sense. Well, it's an exciting place to be on the web right now. Oh, it absolutely is. I mean, it's just incredible. This is What's really incredible about this is that this is day one. This is the very beginning. This is the Kitty Hawk stage of electronic commerce. We're moving forward in so many different areas, and lots of different companies are as well. And the late 20th century is just a great time to be alive. You know, we're going to find out that, a mil um, I think, a millennia from now, people are going to look back and say, wow, the late 20th century was really a great time to be alive on this planet. Those two videos, Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos, were taken right near the beginning of the founding of their companies. Steve Jobs articulating very clearly that Apple was in the business of making tools, tools that made people super, gave them, gave them superpowers. Bezos was demonstrating what his choices were regarding books and other things of how it would work for selling on the internet and also his customer first mentality. These were key things in the founder objective and it was expressed right there at the founding of those companies, which is very interesting. Now let's go through some of those other dimensions other than founder vision. Internal organization. Perhaps the most important decisions companies will make right at their founding is who the first person they're going to hire is and who the second is. And that is related to the capabilities that they are building out. In order to make those decisions, you have to have some idea of where you are heading. If you are a technical founder and you want to head in the direction of being able to strike licensing deals, for instance, for your technology versus taking your technology all the way to market yourself, that's going to really influence on what that founding team looks like. If you've got a license, you've got to have some legal expertise, some negotiating expertise in your capabilities. By contrast, if you're taking stuff directly to market, you're going to have marketing, production, who knows what. Okay. These are different choices, but they're intimately related to other choices you are making in terms of how you commercialize your ideas. And it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. It talks about, you know, the investments you have to make. Remember, your resources are scarce. Which capabilities are you going to actually enhance? And how are you going to learn and experiment and choose what to do next? Including, how much do you punish failure? Now, these things that get talked about all the time. You've heard them throughout your degree studies in management. But this is where it becomes important. 
And the only thing I want to emphasize to you is there are choices here. You don't just have capabilities based on necessarily what you have right here now. You have to think about the rest of your strategy and make this choice that aligns with it. Let's now watch a video of American Girl Place. What a wonderful welcome and what a wonderful day. I am so happy to be with all of you to celebrate the 25th anniversary of American Girl. Where did the time go? I used to think of myself as the mother of American Girl. I guess now I've become the grandmother. <laughs> and it seems to have happened in a blink of the eye. Somewhere in the archives of this company is a postcard written in green ink that I sent to my dear friend, Valerie Tripp, whom you all know. It said, as best I can remember, I've been down in Williamsburg this week and had an idea. What do you think of it? A series of books about nine-year-old girls growing up at different times in American history. There would be six books for each, and the stories would reflect the important moments of girlhood and how it changed and how it stayed the same over the years. There would be a doll for each character with historically accurate clothes and accessories so girls could play out the stories. There might even be matching clothes for the girls. And with that postcard, the idea for the American Girls Collection was born. But it didn't stop with that postcard. A few months later, on a wintry November weekend, my husband Jerry and I went to our cabin up in the North Woods, and we stayed in the little tiny boathouse there. The idea about historical books and dolls had been percolating in my brain, and sitting by the wood stove, I sat down to write out my vision. I have done a lot of writing in my life, but never before or since have words flowed so easily and so quickly. By the end of the weekend, I knew, just simply knew, that this was a good idea. Why? Because I would have loved it when I was a little girl, myself. And as an adult, I would have loved to give it to my nieces, who I know would love it too. I understand today that I was my own one-person focus group. <laughs> Within me was the favorite aunt, the adult who knew what she wanted to give, and the child who knew what she wanted to get. And from that moment on, I just trusted my instincts to lead me in the right direction. It was a good thing my intuition was so strong, because when I left the cozy boathouse and began to ask people what they thought of my big idea, I was met with disbelief and patronizing tolerance summarized as, are you kidding? <laughs> Historical dolls in the day and age of Barbie? How are you going to make them? Uh, I don't know. Do you even have a fax machine, I was asked? No, I didn't even know what a fax machine was. <laughs> but what I didn't know didn't stop me. I simply knew I had a good idea, and somehow I would figure out how to get it done. So 25 Septembers ago, 500,000 catalogs went into the mail, and we held our breath. But ring the phones did, and prep we did. The concepts of staging and inventory control never entered our minds. And pick and pack and ship we did. And when the season was over, Santa had come to us too. We had sales of over a million dollars. The little girls. <laughs> The little girls and their mothers, <clears throat> grandmas and aunts, wanted what I wanted to give them. An American girl was on its way. From its inception, it was a doll company, a toy company, a clothing company, a publishing company, and a direct mail company all at once. But in truth, from its beginning vision, it was a company that was bigger than the sum of all those parts. It was a girl company 
and anything that was good for girls was ours to give them. It wasn't all easy, and there were mistakes made. There were times of challenge and disappointment, and it was tempting to read each bump in the road as an omen for our demise. For instance, in the year that followed, we outgrew our pitiful little warehouse on Blount Street and moved to the cornfield in Middleton, where a million daffodil bulbs were planted, and not one grew. <laughs> Was this an omen for the future we fretted? Would American Girl fail to bloom too? But through it all, we were propelled by the energy of our booming sales, our growing audience of growing girls, and our besotted customers. What a ride it was. Finding that bright red box with the dolls she dreamed about under the Christmas tree is indeed a magical moment for a little girl, though it will soon pass into a happy childhood memory. But the stories of the American girls' lives, simple on the surface, but rich and rewarding in their emotional truth, are what will stick for years to come. That is the nourishment, the goodness, that will strengthen her spirit and guide her. And that goodness has the power to change her and change the world. That, my friends, is what one woman's vision has grown into over 25 years. American Girl Place, if you haven't been in it already, is a very targeted endeavor. It looks like this. It's basically an entire, I want to call it toy store, but it's a little bit more departmenty store. Uh, and it's targeted explicitly at girls. You go in there, they're selling these dolls. And the dolls, because of the founder that you just watched, has uh, a particular care about education and history. So they all have backstories that are born out of, and this is the American in American Girl, the American history. But they can do more. More than these just, as it turns out, expensive dolls. Uh, this is the one uh, that my daughter uh, bought out um, during one very expensive trip. Um, let me tell you, do not enter that place uh, with your wallet, because you won't be coming out with it. Not only can you accessorize, you can actually, there's a salon in there, and you can actually get your dolls and daughters hair done. I gotta say, the picture there, which is a picture <laughs> that I have seen, uh, you gotta ask yourself where you've come in life to have ended up as a doll hairstylist anyway nonetheless it's there and also you also see this this is a picture i took uh there's a certain sort of customer who finds it quite exhausting you can also have tea with your dolls you can have all sorts of things it's a whole experience if you haven't seen it and you have any taste and appreciation for marketing at all you will go to american girl do girl place but the point about all this is look at this thing as a modicum of identity. Look at it. Everything fits together with it. It is coming up with an experience for, uh, I guess, six to 11 year old girls that is purely targeted on them, unashamedly so. And so whatever you might think about that, know this was a choice from the founder and it was a choice that was put in place initially through a mail order thing just selling the dolls to eventually the rollout of these american girl places and these are extremely successful bits of retailing real estate right there as a result so this is all to do with external position this is all to be thinking about the relationship you're going to have with customers. Okay, You can sell customers dolls, or you can sell customers experience. I know that sounds cheap, but it's really true. 
where are you going to be in the channel? Initially, American Girl was all about mail order. And then it moved up, moved into retail and moved in in a big way. How would it actually do this? We're going to provide some readings that talk about how do you actually put a new doll on the shelf in this business? Okay, it's something you have to think about. And also, what about your supply chain? Now, obviously, in this case, you're going to sell a hundred dollar doll. You can make it. Uh, it's a little bit easier to make than the stuff you see elsewhere. And you'll want that too, because you're trying to get an heirloom and then you're trying to get people to buy accessories and things like that. And if you're your daughter doll gets one outfit and your daughter's going to get the matching outfit it's probably going to be uh, also good quality these are all part of external positioning okay and these are choices that american girl made and as a result there are no competitors uh, here in canada there's a canada girl uh and it's it's it doesn't quite come up to it an american girl uh is uh, is coming into canada as well after all it is north america Final, uh, oh, let, let me uh, pause. Do, 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 do. Just one example of uh, that external positioning was this company initially called Price Club. And the Price Club uh, had a membership model uh, whereby you paid for membership and then you came into this like warehouse and you could buy stuff in bulk. Okay. That's the inventor of, the, uh, of it. Uh, believe it or not, this is Mr. Price. <laughs> I don't know if that was a coincidence or anything like that, but, you know, it's kind of interesting. And as a founder, he liked to claim that he read The Daily Worker instead of The Wall Street Journal. He was considerably more generous with benefits and wages than other discounters, Walton included. And unlike Walton in those days, Price gave money to the charities generously and often through a foundation he created to which he handed $70 million. Okay. So we have this person who wanted to allow cheap bulk goods made in an exclusive club, treated his work as well, and eventually this company became Costco. Okay. Costco today had its origins with a founder who was reading The Daily Worker rather than The Wall Street Journal. All of this philosophy and the culture and uh, the things we believe in, it all started at Fedmart. My father had uh, a couple of clients who had come to him with this concept of putting a membership discount store in San Diego, which opened in December of 1954. The store was a success from the day it started. The concept was great. It was a membership discount store. Fedmart was limited selection, high quality, at the lowest price. The leader who was Saul Price, and still that in everybody. His concept was so simple, it made such sense. To represent the customer, to represent the employee, in a way that maximized the value of the relationship. Jim attributes so much of his success in the way he approaches business to the fact that he works along with my dad and had such respect for my dad. Jim didn't start out as a box boy as everyone thinks. He actually started out throwing mattresses around the warehouse. He was carrying these mattresses on his back. He hears someone behind him yelling and screaming at him, hey, you, put that mattress down. What are you trying to do? You're going to hurt your back and then we'll wind up being sued. And Jim didn't know who was talking to him and he asked the guy he was working with, who the hell was that guy? And, of course, it was Saul Price. Jim and the group from uh, Fedmark go back many, many years. While I was serving in a senior executive position, Jim ran the best part of the Fedmart operation. He had tremendous respect from everybody. Robert Price called us all together. He says, I want to appoint a, uh, a head merchant. So he handed out these ballots. Jim got all ten votes, including his own which I thought was hilarious. The FedMart story concluded in December of 1975 when after having sold the business to another party, my father was fired by those people. And in February of 1976, we incorporated the Price Company. And then in July of 
that same year, and we opened the Price Club. By April 1st, 76, he had found this facility here at Marina Boulevard. We agreed that it would be membership and that the wholesale members would pay $25 a year. We wanted a 100,000 square foot building, a cavernous warehouse, and we were gonna put steel racks down both sides and have the middle of it be at a very low profile so that the member would come in and they'd be able to look from the front of the building to the back of the building, and all they would see is masses of merchandise. We opened with a dud. It was underwhelming. We didn't have a lot of people show up, and uh, it was scary. Most people don't know this, but racquetball played a huge role in the development of the warehouse club business. Jim was still with FedMart. He was running FedMart at this point. And he used to come and play racquetball with us at a facility that was right next door to us. And one day he says to us, you know, they're selling balls and rackets here. He says, this is retail business, why can't you do it? And we ended up finally going down and looking at the zoning maps and determining that we could do retail. And once that happened, we were able to combine wholesale and retail, change the products, change the hours, change just about everything other than the philosophy, and the business took off. Before that occurred, uh, the Price Club was not very successful. Can you imagine if we had closed the doors? None of this would have happened. There wouldn't have ever been a Price Club, a merger, or a Costco, and it wouldn't have changed the whole retail industry. My dad got me interested in coming down to see the Price Club, and I went down, and it was about 9 in the morning, uh, midweek. When I drove in, the entire parking lot was full, and the people were standing in line to, waiting for the doors to open. And I thought, well, there's some special promotion going on today. It'll be interesting to see what it is, what, what they've done to stir up the populace. And of course, uh, they open the doors, people stream in, and it wasn't a special day at all. It was just a concept that had, uh, captured the imagination of a lot of people. In addition to that, I had been in Europe and I had seen a hypermarket, specifically a company called Carrefour. And I thought that uh, some combination of those would make a lot of sense. I get a call one day, probably around 1982, and it's a guy by the name of Jeff Brotman from Seattle. He says, I saw the, the Price Club. I'm considering starting a similar operation in, in Seattle, Washington. And he said, would you be interested in coming up here and, and, and working for us? He was the head merchant at Price Club, and I thought, perfect. He would be someone who could really run the merchandising side of the business, if not the entire business. I didn't know that he was related to Saul Price. I said, I'm satisfied where I am. He said, okay, do you happen to know anyone that could do it? I said, there's one guy in the country can do it, and that's Jim Senegal. And they got together, and the rest is history. I called Jim, and Jim was Jim. He was very straightforward. It was pretty clear to me that every aspect of what it would take to be successful in the warehouse club business, Jim knew about had probably done himself. We were in California and our daughter Susie was in high school and she didn't want to move and I just kept telling her to ignore him because it was never going to happen. This fellow Jeff had shown up with this big idea. We put the business plan together. Uh, we thought we needed about three and a half million dollars to start the business. We were wildly oversubscribed. We ended up uh, taking seven and a half million dollars. Jim and I turned to each other at the close and we said we will never need another nickel to grow this business. And of course, about nine months later, we raised an additional $17 million. And about a year after that, an additional 30 million as the business grew. There was eight of us that got together in April of 1983. We didn't even have a name at the time and we didn't even have a building. The energy was so strong and so positive that you wanted to just be a part of it. I came to Costco to run operations. Of course, when I started with Costco, we didn't have any operations. so. Uh, it was a pretty easy job. He hired uh, four kind of uh, rogue managers, uh, me being one of them. I had no idea what Costco was. And when I went in for the interview, I thought, well, I could do this. I figured that it had about a 50-50 chance of survival. I came to Costco when there were two warehouses opened. I met Jim in Los Angeles, started in April of 1984. My first name badge, which still is in the old one window of fame, 
has Costco Wholesale Club on it. Jim came through and said he was starting up a price club type operation in the Northwest. I jumped at the chance. Jim and Jeff were naive enough to think I knew what to do. And they said, you want to come out and be our VP of Finance? It was like the Wild West. We ran the business by the seat of our pants. The people who had left their lives in San Diego or Los Angeles or wherever they came from and, and moved to Seattle were moving on the basis of their faith in many instances in Jim. When Jim opened up Costco, followed him right to Seattle. And no guarantees of anything. <laughs> there were no contracts or anything like that. Just the concept that we knew of the Price Club being successful and knowing uh, a guy by the name of Jim Senegal's ethics and drive. And that, that was it. I'll provide some readings about this one too. It's a fascinating story. Finally, ecosystem. Jeff Bezos uh, explicitly chose to locate Amazon, its headquarters, in Seattle, in Washington. Okay, It could get tech resources, that's where Microsoft was, that's where Boeing was. It didn't have to worry about that same uh, funding, it had already had funding, that was the link Bezos himself, he came from Wall Street. But it built up an ecosystem right then and there because it was a good place to be able to be able to build out warehouses and experiment with them and have a headquarters. Now Amazon is choosing a second headquarters, but this is 20 years later. It chose its ecosystem and its ecosystem served its well. For the firms that you'll be dealing with in the Creative Destruction Lab, the choice is usually between uh, staying in Canada versus going to Silicon Valley. And at some point, there will be that choice, unless, of course, they're already in Silicon Valley, as some of them are. And those choices are really difficult. The benefits to going to Silicon Valley are obvious. A lot of successful firms, a lot, the ecosystem is already there. A lot of the resources are available. It's a little expensive, depending on where you want to live in Silicon Valley, but that's the trade-off. Staying in Canada, well, there are different things. One is you are uh, potentially in a smaller pond that reduces the competition for certain resources. But on the other hand, there is less of a funding uh, ecosystem, uh, but there is uh, government involvement. These are the trade-offs that you will have to weigh. And it's all part of the choice of identity. 